successful rum sale. And I want to acknowledge two people that especially made that happen. And hopefully they are here is Rebecca Walp and Susan Stevens Garcia here. Come, come forward. We, we have some lovely flowers up here for you, so thank you. And um, Susan, why don't, when, when the service is over, take your flowers. So thank you so much for all that. Um, and I'm not sure where Rebecca is. She's hiding or resting, perhaps. Um, so the, the major question is, how much junk did we sell? And to the tune of $4,200. So thank you. So that, is, that means that we have quality junk here at Southminster. So. The reopening task force would just like to remind everybody since um, the Delta variant is real, we are asking everyone to mask up as if you at all possibly can do so. When we're at worship or in, in, in groups in the church, um, you're requested to mask, to mask up. Also in the fall, just remember Southminster Reads, and if you can be reading the book in defense of kindness, it is going to be an excellent read and also something we'll talk about in the fall. Also to let you know that we are in the midst of hiring for our children's coordinator. Actually, the title is Family Life Coordinator. If you know of anyone or have any thoughts about who I might talk to, please let me know um, so we can get that done. A bit of sad news in that Susan, Suzanne Angelo's mother died last night. So please keep Suzanne and the family, Patty and Maureen, were with her when she died. She was 96 years old raised a wonderful family and lived a family-filled life. So please keep um, the family in your prayers. So today our lay reader is Mark Mullins and of course our pianist is Madeline's, Madeline Zero. So let's take a moment to pause ourselves to reflect on Margaret Wheatley. She writes, I believe we can change the world if we start talking to one another again. Let us join together and call to worship with Mark. Would you please stand? I totally forgot I was doing this today, so here we are. <laughs> Nature, mediation, prayer, art, music, and time spent outdoors can all be sources of solitary comfort and joy. Giving and receiving both strengthen our social bonds. Checking on the neighbor, seeking advice, even just offering a smile to the stranger, all can make us stronger. Together, we worship because we see God in each other.
Please be seated. And I invite the children, if you want to come, can you come up here to the front row? And the two of you, and three of you, come on over here. And I'll move this chair over there for you. So you can sit on a chair or on the floor, that'd be great. I have a major question for you. What is your favorite animal? What is your favorite animal, Lucas? Elephants. Okay, very good. Somebody else? <coughs> Dolphin. So, and yes, Sophia? Otter. Otter. Oh, yes, you do. An elephant on your shirt. Oh, wonderful. So, let me ask you do you think that elephants, otters, and Dolphins ever played together? M maybe, okay. Well, I'm going to show you a video of um, two different animals, coyotes and badgers. And most often you don't think that coyotes and badgers hang out together, but sometimes they do. One is a species that runs really fast. Which one is that? Coyote. And the other one is one that burrows into the ground. Which one is that? What are they doing hanging out together? You think? Okay, okay, very good, very good. Look, at, I'm going to show you a one minute video about the coyote and badger. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a minute long? Yep. Okay, it should be it. It was just during the normal review of the video when the researchers came across something they had not expected. Here in the Coyote Valley, just south of San Jose, the Peninsula Open Space Trust is studying how animals travel at night. There are 50 game cameras hidden around and under highways. Infrared night video recorded a coyote about to cross under one road when suddenly a badger appeared. Coyotes and badgers are known to team up and hunt together. Badgers like to dig, and they like to dig fast. Yeah. And so uh, there's footage out there of a badger flushing a ground squirrel nest and, and getting a, a ground squirrel of its own. Uh, but there's another ground squirrel that comes out another entrance to the, the den, and the coyote nabs that one. Something you'd see in a Disney movie. Different predator species not just getting along, but playing. Another video shows a full-grown buck moving under a freeway, not paying any attention to the roar of the traffic just above his head. One by one, you know, spot by spot, where these cameras and the roadkill surveys, uh, we're working with our research team at Pathways for Wildlife, and we're getting a really good perspective mm -hmm. um, of the sort of the wildlife dynamics, the interactions with the roadways. It's only been a year and a half into a three-year study, but so far, the cameras are showing a great deal of movement at night. The data is expected to help shape future urban planning decisions. In Palo Alto, Don Ford, KPIX5. That, that was the video, yes, thank you. Um, so badgers and coyotes can even play together and cooperate and be a, on the same mission together. Well, we are sending 23 people from Southminster, 15 high school students, four college students, and four adults on a mission to Spokane. And we're going to be meeting with people that are very different than us. A lot of them come from lower economic 
classes, meaning that they are poorer than we are, and yet we're going to combine with them and do a mission project in the West Central neighborhood. Whenever we reach out to others, we are doing mission. And especially as we reach out to those who are different than us, those that we might think, well, we would never hang out with. Well, as Christians, we are called to seek out people who are different and to find places that we share in the same mission. So as we get ready to send this team to um, Spokane, I'm going to have them stand up. And only about 15, well, maybe less, are here today. But you'll see the names of everyone going. Many of them are across country, but they'll be back here Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock. A couple of them are sick. Lots of different summer reasons for the reason why they're not all here this morning. But as we send this team, we go to Spokane, we're going to be partnering with the Westminster Presbyterian Church, as always. But one thing new this year is that West Central has um, garnered energy and people have come together and developed this new nonprofit, and they call themselves the West Central Development Project. And they're trying to combat all of the issues that are stemming from impo impoverished people right alongside those who are very, very rich. In other words, a lot of rich people have come into different parts of Spokane and West Central and built it up and the mansions on the river. One block away is West Central, the lowest, highest poverty rate in the state of Washington. So what to do with the dichotomy between what is happening with rich people on one side and poor people that are sort of left for themselves um, is things that we are going to be looking at and working towards. So let's take a moment and if you could just put your hand up and we're going to lay our hands on this mission team. Um, okay, well, sure, why don't we um, just put your hands down for a second. <laughs> Kathy said, how about we get introduced to people? Um, so, uh, can you yell out your name? Um, I'm Ari. And Ari, you are a junior at, at Beaverton High School, but going to PCC. You know, as sophomore at um, Monside, of course. I, yeah. Mary? I'm Mary and I'm going to get a chaperone. Short hair. Short time to be in Spokane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. Can't get rid of me. So, and the others couldn't be here today, but um, we're hoping that a good swath of them are available in two weeks because they are going to be leading the worship service and talking about their experience. So let's raise our hands 
and lay our hands upon this team. God of life's journey and great spirit here and everywhere. As this mission team embarks upon this experience of partnership and justice seeking in Spokane, we pray that they might be strengthened with spirit and grace of this community of faith. We pray for the hand of guidance and mercy and protection. May their experience renew each of their gifts and may they each receive a blessing of inner growth. And upon their return may we share the fruits of this collective journey of love and faith that binds us across all space and time with all of God's people. Amen. So you all may be seated, and the children, you're all going to follow Kathy outside. Acts chapter 2, all came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And the theme reading from Vivek Murthy, who I believe is the Surgeon General of the United States, right? Being connected to others gives us a stake in more than our own interests. It expands those interests to include our whole community and thus increases our motivation to work together. So Mark, you do very well for not being prepared. So it happens to all of us, thank you. Together again, this summer has been a rebirth in so many ways. The Rumsdale week is always an experience, but this week was especially special. We had no shortage of volunteers like we sometimes do in the past. Many of my normal support tasks were voluntarily taken on by others, which gave me space just to be with people. The connections and energy and conversations between young and old and everywhere in between was simply inspiring. Like coyotes and badgers, we were on a mission together, together again.
Coyotes and badgers are normally very different from one another and often do not mingle, as you know. Human beings have their differences too, which often limit our interactions. Our unique perspectives on the world often leave us entrenched in our own bunkers. For example, why did the chicken cross the road? <laughs> well, there are predictable responses depending on who you ask. Joe Biden would say, well, like Rocky Balboa, I am a fighter. I have fought my whole life for the chickens of Pennsylvania and now the US. I will not give up fighting for the chickens on the road. Donald Trump would say, there was no collusion. He might add, I don't believe we need to get the chickens across the road. I say we give the road to the chickens and let them decide. Barack Obama would say, well, there is hope for the chickens. As long as we stay together, we can all get to the other side. And of course, the youth have their own set of responses. Why did the chicken cross the road? Well, the junior eyes might say, it depends if there was pizza or donuts involved. <laughs> the senior high youth would say, sup, chicken. Or, that's what she says. <laughs> Don't ask about that one. <laughs> and college students would say, perhaps, I don't know, but is that going to be on the exam? <laughs> we all have our different perspectives on the motive of the chicken. And we are often limited, and we limit ourselves by our own shallow views of the world around us. Today, I want to talk about the moments when we have experienced significant change in our own perspectives and in our lives. Portland author Brian Doyle tells this story about change. Committed a sin yesterday in the hallway at noon. I roared at my son. I grabbed him by the shirt collar. I frightened him so badly that he cowered and wept. And when he turned to run, I grabbed him by the arm so roughly that he flinched and it was the flicker of fury and pain across his face. The bright anger, body, riveting face I've loved for 10 years. It was that fear that sent him snarling into the night. And I can never get that out of my mind. It torments me. Doyle says, I do not know how sins are forgiven. I grasp the concept, I admire the genius of the idea. I suspect that it has, it is the seed of all real peace, but I do not understand how foul can be made fair. No God can forgive what we do to each other. Only the injured can summon that extraordinary grace. Doyle goes on to tell the story. The instant I let go of my son's arm, he sprinted and went away, slammed the door, and ran down the street, and I stood there simmering in my shame. Then I walked down the hill 
into the laurel thicket of dance and silent as dawn as the world and I found my son there sobbing. We knelt together in the moist green dark for a long time, not saying anything, their branches burly and patient. Finally, finally, I asked quietly for his forgiveness. And he asked for mine. And we walked out of the woods hand in hand Change men. Change human beings. Change that was not planned, but because someone took the first step, realized what they had done and the wrong that they did, took the first step, made change happen. Sometimes that's all it takes, just reaching out to another, being vulnerable, together again. Our American culture suggests that change can be willed, can be thought through, can be planned for and organized around. And some change can be like that. I don't deny that. But I am struck by how often real change comes after an event or a shock in our way of life, a jolt that jars us out of our habits. This year, year and a half of COVID was such an event. It takes energy, some force, so often to shift us off of our times, to break our bodies of heart and mind, to open us up to new possibilities and new hope. Let me ask you this, how, how do you see the world differently today than you did two years ago? I believe George Floyd's murder was that kind of event that shocked many white Americans. A shock that called millions out into the streets and thousands to examine their white privilege. In my own life, it took a stroke to get me to slow down and change my values, to convince me finally to listen once again to the call of ministry. I'd been working so hard to get my PhD and working full time in an additional internship long ago now. But I remember vividly the shock to my system when I finally had to accept that I could not do it on my own. I remember that it took that shock to make me realize that I needed to be together again. It was that event that became a blessing as I hobbled myself into this community and prepared to adopt children. Sierra and Tony. My life was forever changed. I am reminded of the loghead turtle story as told by Barbara Brown Taylor in her book, Leaving the Church to Find God. It's the story of a turtle stranded on the beach but later rescued by a park ranger and dragged <laughs> back to the ocean. Taylor writes, Sometimes God's blessing does not come until daybreak. After a full night of emptying ourselves and wandering in the wrong direction. I have told my story from the pulpit before. 
I say it again, because we collectively have just lived through a huge shock, a full night of emptying ourselves, a devastating shock to our systems, our personal systems and our collective systems. This pandemic, these past 15 man, months, called so many things into question. How and where do we work? What do schools really look like? How should we shop? How do we socialize? How we do church? Not to mention all of the losses that we need to grieve. We have been jolted out of so many habits and now that we are together again, we have a chance to make changes in the way we treat each other, in the way we see each other. We have the opportunity to approach life differently, the opportunity to let others in like never before, to change our perspectives to become vulnerable. I had the opportunity to sit down with Denise King, formerly known as Denise Scheidler, this last week. Denise was a member of the youth group when I first arrived in 2006. Denise went on, on our first mission trip to Spokane in 2007. In fact, it was Denise and six other students and Audrey Scheidler as a leader that asked if we could return to Spokane every other year instead of it just being a one and done event. They believed that it was important for us to maintain our connection in Spokane because of the vitally important ministry of the West Central neighborhood. They were internally and forever changed. I believe that mission trips are catalyst for change not because of what we do or accomplish, but because of what happens inside of us. And just as important, because of the relationships that we build and nurse. It is an opportunity for sure for us to see how poor people live and function. But we also realize that those of us in the middle class who may not be in poverty when it comes to material possessions, perhaps live in a different kind of poverty when it comes to our perspectives, our way of life, and the way we view others. I remember one boy in particular Sean, when I was the youth director in Sandpoint, Idaho, here was a kid that was a complete troublemaker, even more than Tony is. <laughs> Other parents were lobbying for this kid not to go on the mission trip to Mexico. He would only mess it up. He wasn't serious. Well, I made sure he went. And when he came back, he asked if he could preach a part of the sermon at our youth Sunday. I will never forget what he said. He said, we Americans look at those Mexicans and we think those poor Mexicans, they don't have anything. But then he said, I was wondering, I was wondering if they don't look at us and say those poor Americans, they don't have anything. 
Sean became a catalyst for change in the youth group and for us to do so much more mission and service work than we had been doing. He was forever changed. Mission work is about taking the first step toward others. To be sure, the issues surrounding poverty and food and housing insecurity are massive. And we will discover that this week. We don't have all the answers. And we certainly should not have our own agenda. We simply make ourselves available and even more importantly vulnerable so that change can take place in us. And maybe, just maybe, in others along the way. Barbara Brown Taylor offers these words. Our job is to struggle with the terrors, neither surrendering or stealing away until they have yielded their blessing. It may seem that the people we serve on a mission trip are in but desperate need, and that may be true. But it is also true that we are the ones in desperate need. Now that we are together again, a community of support and purpose, don't let the world pass you by without examining your life, your practices, and your calling. Together again, it is time for us to recognize whether coyote or badger, we belong to one mission together. Together again. Now is the time to step forward with the person or persons you may have hurt. Now is the time to step up and make things right. Together again. The shock of this pandemic has changed our perspective forever. Now is the time to do something about it and right the wrongs of injustice wherever we see it. And for those going to Spokane this week, together again, pay attention. Pay attention to yourselves, each other, and especially those you meet. Make a new friend. Make two new friends. Practice forgiveness. Take the first step. Be open to the shock of this new experience and let it change you and mold you into someone who is deeper and more compassionate. And as I've shared with you for over 30 years of leading mission trips, be the change you want to see. So why did the chicken really cross the road? <laughs> Duh. To be together again with coyotes and badgers because that is how life should be and to do what needed to be done. Let us do likewise. Amen. Let's stand together and join together in the hymn.
as well. You don't have to do anything, so don't be nervous. So we have a bit of time. Um, are there any joys or concerns that you have other than what we already know together? Yes, Alice. So Alice's mother-in-law, or your daughter's mother-in-law, is in the hospital with COVID. And yeah, any other concerns or joys? Yep, back there. And that's how Mary. you share a joy and squeeze an announcement. <laughs> <in joy>. so. <laughs> so someone over here. Yes. So in Allison and Kathleen over there is going to be a uh, here for the year as well. So, and a part of the youth group, and I'm thrilled her first place of meeting people is on the mission trip to really bond together. So, welcome to both of you. Yes, Judy. It was fun watching the Facebook pictures. Yeah, very fun. Um, Jason. Claire on Zoom's got something to say. Uh, Claire, go ahead and unmute yourself. Claire who? Claire Schrader. Yeah, Schrader's Claire. not here. Okay, I'm here. She's going on a mission to get with us. And Claire, did you want to say something? Um, no, I just that I'm really happy to be going. Um, 
And I have a little friend here with me who some of you may recognize. Rachel my granddaughter, Rachel. In Spokane, um, but she's going to participate on some of the activities that we do together at Westminster. So, and um, Claire will be meeting us in Spokane. Okay, let's take a moment and you know, one more. Sorry, it didn't turn. I just wanted to um, remember all of the firefighters who are fighting the wildfires across the country. I just saw on Facebook that a former coworker of mine was evacuated. Um, she's back in her house now, but it, they, those guys work and women work tireless hours and we really do appreciate what they do yeah. and pray to keep them safe. Yeah, for the fire, fire workers um, all around the country, especially in the Northwest. So. Let's bow our heads and come to God. Gracious God, we come together in this place. We pray for wisdom. We pray for collective responsibility and for hope. May we come to know that we are better together than we are by ourselves. And we pray for all the, those who are in our hearts this morning. Remember Michelle Miller and Hank and Kay and Rebecca and Maggie and Ambrose and Barbara and Greta and Bert. And for all those we just mentioned, we pray for Suzanne and her family in the passing of Betty. Give each of them a sense of strength and purpose, even in this difficult time. God of this world, restore our faith in community. Grant vision to us to see how we and others can live this journey and how we might witness to all that we can be in this world. A message of hope, a message of love and compassion to everyone. We pray this through the name and spirit of Jesus. Let us join together in the prayer as printed in the bulletin or on the screen, the prayer of St. Francis, a calling to join one mission together. Lord, make us a channel of your peace where there is hatred, May we bring love. Where there is wrong, may we bring the spirit of forgiveness. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. Where there is despair, may we bring hope. Where there are shadows, may we bring light. Where there is sadness, may we bring joy. Lord, grant that we may seek to comfort rather than be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by self-forgiving that one finds. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen. So I invite you to stand together and we're going to sing one final song. Shalom, my friend.
people of Southminster, as we go into this week, as our mission team represents us in Spokane, let us all go out as coyotes and badgers, <laughs> seeking where we can make a difference, seeking to bond with people who are different, knowing that the God above us will keep us, the God below us will ground us, and the God beside us will walk with us each and every day. Amen.